I think this set of slides, uh, I think I can leave you to uh, read it on your own. It's again <laughs> about the scientific process, how there are details that um, in class like in any class really, we necessarily simplify, but I want you to know that they, they, they do exist so that um, you don't see as a science as a, some polished, pre-made thing. It's a process and it can get messy. If you follow these links, you will see um, people with a PhD messing up. Uh, here it's a messing up through mistake. <laughs> here it's someone who's actually cost the US government a lot of money. Uh, one of the people who's at this link is um, someone who faked the discovery of elements and they had to recheck basically everything he was involved in because, um, you know, he, he lied and that, so, yeah. so, you know, science is a, a potentially a com complicated process. So I wanted to, you to see that. And, um, and the, um, Let's see, what's really important to hear is the, the Hertz-Sprung-Russell diagram. It's uh, kind of the key thing. And um, so, I, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, I, let me just uh, have this, or, or let me point out two things, <laughs> two important things. One important thing is the idea of standard candle, and it's associated both with the Cepheid variables that you will see discussed in the slides. And uh, the idea of standard candle will come up in the next sub-module with the type 1a supernova. And um, these uh, um, standard, the standard candles or the things that allow you to measure distances to far away stars is important because that's the information that goes into constructing something like the this diagram, uh, HR diagram. Because in constructing this diagram, you need two pieces of information. One is a spectral class, which you can read off of the spectrum of the star, but the other is the luminosity. And um, you can measure the brightness of a star, but brightness just tells you how bright it appears to us. It doesn't, um, it doesn't tell you how much light the star is actually outputting. And to get that, you need to know the distance. So, so in order to obtain enough information for the y-axis of HR diagram, um, you need to be able to determine distances to the distant stars. Well, let me just uh, wrap up this uh, a thing especially about the standard candle uh, with uh, uh, pointing out of the things that's in some module 4.3 uh, which is uh, discussion of the end stage of uh, stars and this uh, the, some of the slides in some module 4.3 uh, do give you some um, ideas for observational evidence for some of the things we say in submodule 4.2, because I want you to be asking the question, how would we know anything that we say? So one of the things we say in the submodule 4.2 is about uh, main sequence stars and uh, how stars progress through uh, life. And one of the evidences for that are observation of clusters. So clusters are stars that are formed at about the same time. So they give you an idea of um, the stellar evolution. So this is a, a version of HR diagram for a cluster, uh, this cluster, I think. And um, each join starts on the main sequence. And um, so by the way, if you follow the link to the Wikipedia, it'll show you the picture of the cluster. So you have an idea of what it's referring to. And uh, this is showing, this is a young cluster by which we mean uh, all these stars are young enough that they've not run out of their fusion fuel. When you look at an older cluster, you see something that looks like this. You still have the stars on the main sequence, but you have uh, stars that started out as heavier, um, more massive stars that have burned out their nuclear fuel and moved on to their red giant stage. And this is from an old globular cluster that looks like this. And, and, and so this would be one of the evidence that supports the uh, 
supports the ideas of stellar evolution that you have seen in submodule 4.2. So I want you to see that. And uh, one of the end stages of um, a star gives one of our standard candles that we use for determining distance to uh, far away places. It's not type two supernova, uh, even though type two supernova will produce a bright light. It, um, it, um, wait, yeah, bright light. Um, this is the light curve, how uh, the intensity of the light increases and then decreases. Um, type two supernova doesn't give us a standard candle because how bright this is, it kind of depends on how, how massive the star was. So by seeing how bright it was, we can't quite necessarily tell how, how much luminosity the explosion had. Type 1a supernova is different. It has a very particular um, way it, it occurs. And there are particular features that we can look for that, um, that, tell, that gives you a lot of evidence about um, how it occurs. So one is that it always occurs the same way. You have a, a white dwarf, which is an end stage star that is massive, very compact. And this type 1a supernova occurs when this white dwarf accumulates enough of the additional mass that causes it to go supernova. And the, the threshold mass where this explosion occurs, it's determined by laws of physics. So this type 1a supernova goes to supernova at always about the same mass when it, when it goes supernova. So this uh, occurs always the same way. It doesn't quite depend on how much mass the initial star had, how much mass the secondary star has. The size of this explosion is always going to look the same. And there are, when, you, when we see supernovas in the sky, there are some things we can look for that tells us, oh, that is type 1a supernova. So we can use its brightness as a standard candle. And I think the slides tell you what you can look for. Uh, type 1a supernova. Uh, um, something about the spectroscopy, I think. Uh, oh, let me see if I can find it in the slides. This thing, uh, yeah, by lack of hydrogen lines, because um, by the time this star goes to supernova, it's burned out all its hydrogen fuel. Whereas when you're looking at type two supernova, um, when it's going supernova, it has plenty of hydrogen on the outer regions. So you see hydrogen lines. So 